Congressman Jerry Litton believes that a democracy depends on informed people. He also believes our government should be more open and accessible to the people. To better inform you of what is happening in your government, Missouri's 6th District Congressman Jerry Litton invites Washington personalities to come to Missouri each month and join him in an unrehearsed, question and answer, open to the public town meeting to discuss key issues facing our nation. Dialogue with Lytton brings you closer to your government and Washington closer to you. Senator Eagleton, what do you think of these hundreds of people here in this room coming out for a monthly town meeting with the politicians? Well, I think it's nothing short of magnificent. Bear in mind there's a lot of competition today. You've got professional football that's probably the most attractive thing on the TV calendar and for people to come out on a Sunday afternoon when they have other competing desires is a real tribute to uh, Congressman Litton. I think it's marvelous. Thanks. Senator Eagleton, I think the Congressman is about ready to start the program, but Good. we're so happy to have you here for our My dialogue pleasure. with Litton meeting, and I, I think we're ready to start the questions and answers. Very good. I'm Thank looking you. forward to it. Okay. Our guest today, of course, is someone that every Missourian knows. In 1972, he was a Democratic vice presidential nominee. George McGovern came along and said a mistake had been made. <laughs> and then after the McGovern campaign and the Nixon Watergate, it became apparent McGovern was right, a mistake had been made. We should have nominated Tom Eagleton for president, not vice president. <laughs> but I guess uh, Tom is a man who served as circuit attorney in St. Louis. He served as lieutenant governor and as attorney general for Missouri. He served as junior senator and soon to be senior senator from Missouri. He's a man who's done everything from stopping the bombing in Cambodia to stopping the mandatory seat belts in cars. Let's give a good welcome to Senator Tommy <laughs> Oakley. It's good to see it's oh not my. Tom Who anymore, is it? I tell you, I'm tied up in these cords, I'll tell you that. I'll well, be here for a long while getting untangled. If you knew how to handle them too well, they'd think you were a Republican anyway, you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I think we may have some Republicans here. Listen, oh, we do. It's we never, do indeed, the enlightened ones. You know, it's, you know and... and Christianity and religion, they say it's never too late for a conversion, and the same is true in politics. Well, you know, we do have a lot of Republicans that come to these meetings, and one of my good friends uh, that, that attends the meeting was asked by another Republican why they came, and, and uh, she said, well, after all, he's my congressman, too. Good. Well, that's what politics is about nowadays, too, Tom. That's right. We have microphones stationed around the room, and uh, Tom, we never really know what questions are going to be asked, but I'm sure there'll be no question asked today you haven't had asked before. My favorite question, I have an Aunt Hazel that lives in St. Louis. She's my late mother's sister, and I'm sort of her adopted uh, God's child. We have, there's a radio show, you know, in St. Louis and KMOX called At Your Service. And my favorite question, she phoned in one afternoon. I could tell the voice. She didn't say who she was, but uh, I could tell by the voice. It was Aunt Hazel, and she said, Senator, why is it you're the greatest senator in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Hazel, wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Aunt Hazel, but uh, get rid of this. I'm uh, Bob Cullers from Trenton. How do you both feel about um, a federal involvement in the New York City financial affairs? Do you want me to go first? Do we That'd go first? Fine. Right ahead. What do we want? All the back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> if they're easy ones, I'll go first. <laughs> and that is not an easy one. It just so happens, sir. I sat in yesterday on the hearings of the Senate Banking and Urban Affairs Committee. And I have mixed feelings, to be very candid with you. Uh, on the one hand, I don't want to use U.S. tax dollars 
or even more parochially, Missouri tax dollars, to pay for excess waste, which has been the track record of New York City for 15 or 20 years at the very least. And so I have that feeling ingrained in my head. Yet if a default is going to trigger some kind of, of a financial crisis, both nationwide and worldwide, uh, I have to weigh this in the mix. And I, very frankly, not, I, I won't waffle like this on another question. I'm truly uh, undecided. I, I've got to hear from more experts that will tell us, and the congressman, what will ensue, what will likely ensue after December 1st if New York City defaults? That is a tough question. I did not favor bailing out TWA when the time came here in my district, keeping in mind that TWA is the biggest employer in my entire district. And I have more people who vote in my district that work for TWA than anybody else, and I did not favor the government stepping in and bailing out TWA. The same thing held true with Rock Island, and I have no business in my district that has a greater economic impact, really, on the district than Rock Island. I did not favor bailing out Rock Island. Now we come to New York City, and politically, it would be wise for me not to favor bailing out New York City, but I have some concerns, like you do, Tom. And if, indeed, it does disrupt the bond market, as it may, then I would have to favor bailing out New York City. And it bothers me because I don't like to encourage mismanagement, and I think that's why New York's where they are. Indeed. But on the other hand, we've always known that municipal bonds were a good buy. And people all over the United States would buy municipal bonds and feel very secure in their purchase. But now, all of a sudden, if New York were to default on their bonds, I rather suspect that it would be more expensive for Chillicothe, Carrollton, Cameron, Brookfield, Milan, Macon, Moberly, Columbia, Jefferson City, Springfield, Joplin, Kansas City, St. Louis, all of the cities of the United States, I think it'll be more expensive for them to do business. And if that's the case, then I would have to favor bailing them out, provided we put some strings on it and we're capable of that. Very, very tight controls. It sees to it that they manage their city better and that they don't pay their garbage collectors more on retirement than we pay our teachers in Kansas City. That's great. That'll be a tough one. Yes, indeed it will. Would you address yourself to the energy crisis and what the Congress plans to do about it, and also what you see in the future for utility bills? As to the latter, first, uh, I see the future of utility bills going up, up, and up, because the cost of energy is going to go up, up, and up, in spite of uh, the best attempts, I think, of Congress to keep some lid on energy prices. Let me specifically, let me really answer your question by an illustration. Take propane. I bet you in this room, Jerry, there are lots of people who are in farming, and I bet you they use a lot of propane. If the president gets his way, we were debating this in the Senate this, this week. We've been debating it a couple of weeks, as a matter of fact. And the natural gas is deregulated. You're going to see the price of propane that has already tripled or quadrupled over what it was two or three years ago. You're going to see it double and triple again. And you're going to see the greatest runaway costs in, in propane that you can imagine. And propane's not a luxury. Propane's not a frill. Propane to farmers and to many homeowners who use it and to uh, in the city of St. Louis, uh, Louis uses it as a supplement to its natural gas in the peak months of the winter. Uh, you'll, you'll see some enormous escalation in costs. Now, you ask, what is Congress doing about it? What kind of a policy do we have? We have these two very divergent philosophical viewpoints. Ford and Simon, high, higher, and highest prices. The democratically controlled commerce, uh, Congress allocation, cutting off imports at the ports. And thus far, we've not been able to bridge that gap between these two very divergent philosophical viewpoints. I think the problem, uh, very well stated by Tom, it, it's, th there seems to be no area of compromise at all. And Ford says that if we get gasoline up to $5 a gallon, people will buy less. And uh, of course, they will at that price, but you raise gasoline four or five cents a gallon, people don't, don't quit buying gasoline. And you raise gasoline to the farmer, how high do you have to raise gasoline to the farmer before he parks his tractor and doesn't plant a crop? And if he does, what if we gain? And how high do you have to drive the price of uh, heating oil to the older people that have no other source to keep warm in the winter exactly. before they turn off the heat and freeze in the winter? You just can't use price as a mechanism for those things that are essential. But I do think that it's possible for us to pinpoint 
wasteful areas of petroleum products and non-essential areas where there is <coughs> some kind of elasticity of demand where increased prices will discourage increased consumption. Uh, heavy tax on inefficient automobiles is a precise way Indeed. pinpointing wasteful consumption of petroleum and getting price to cause people to use less of it or be more conserving. That's the kind of approach we ought to have, but we, we're really um, at a point where we can't compromise because the president wants one position, the Congress wants the other, nobody's willing to give. That's yes. where we are now. I'm Bill Powell from Princeton, a farmer, and you're right, Jerry, there are a lot of farmers in this crowd. I'd like to ask uh, Senator Eagleton, I know he's very conscious and very concerned about the attitude of consumers, but I'd like to know your feeling on the Russian wheat deal and the other export things that the farmers are feeling very strong about, and there seems to be some conflict between the two opinions. Would you comment on that, Senator? I think there's a closer harmony between Congress and the President on the question of the Russian wheat deal and grain exports than there is in the energy area. I don't think we're terribly far apart. You'll recall that in the late summer, the, uh, a rather large uh, deal was consummated between the Soviet Union and the United States. I think it was 10 million metric tons, wasn't it, Jerry? Okay. Then there was a concern before the uh, crop figures that came out on, was it August 11th? Was that the crop figure right. date? And were we, had, we ex had we contracted to export too much? How big a bumper crop were we going to have? Everybody said it was going to be huge, but did we know for sure? Because, you know, there'd been drought here in Missouri, in the northern half of Missouri. There'd been drought in Kansas and in Iowa, and there, well, some people started to question how big the crop would be. Now that the figures are more complete and we have a more realistic estimate as to what our crop yield is this year, it seems that there is a, an abundant amount. In fact, I'm told around the western part of Missouri here, there's that the grain and uh, elevators aren't going to take any more for the near future. I think we have to realize, too, that, that grain prices are based on the world market. So we stand back and say we're not going to sell any grain to Russia because we want to keep our prices low, we want to keep our food prices low, and uh, what happens? Russia goes to Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, buys their grain from them instead of from us. Our price comes up in the United States ultimately anyway because our price is based on the world market. All we do is lose a substantial sale uh, when we're seriously in trouble in the balance of trade, uh, we bought two and a half billion more in goods than we sold in 71, seven billion more in goods than we sold in 72. Uh, we were in a surplus in 73, a half a billion, mostly because we increased farm exports from nine to 18 billion dollars. Uh, I don't know where we're gonna be in this fiscal year. I know we bought oil last year for seven billion. The same foreign oil this next year is gonna cost us 32 billion. I know we can't continue to buy more than we sell. We're gonna have to sell something. The only thing we can sell in this country that's competitive on the world market is uh, food and guns. Uh, guns because we have a hundred uh, billion dollar uh, subsidy, so to speak, to the military complex and R&D and research and development. And food because the farmers are very efficient. And I think the farmers uh, were not treated fairly. The president said, uh, I'm gonna veto the farm bill because there's a great world market. Uh, Secretary Butt said, I'm gonna recommend to veto the farm bill because there's plenty of market for your food all over the world. And so the farmers went ahead and planted from fence row to fence row, uh, assuming that they could take the word of the president and the secretary. And by the time they harvested their crops, uh, they found out that Mr. Meany, not Mr. Ford, was president. And uh, the longshoremen weren't gonna load the ships and they didn't have a market and they'd been lied to. And they noticed all the fertilizer that they had to buy was being exported, making their prices higher. Farm machinery was being exported, making their prices higher. And uh, at the very time all of this was taking place, it was right during the time the farmers were planting wheat. Now you and I both know what that did to the planting of wheat in this country and what it's gonna to do to the price of food next year. And uh, I think there was far too much politics in the Russian wheat sale. And we ought to stick to producing a product we know how to produce very well selling it on the world market because that's what it is anyway, the world grain market. Take politics out of grain and let the farmers do their job. I think we'd all be a lot better. I think he knows a little about agriculture, doesn't he? <laughs> Where are we? Which side are we on now, Jerry? We, we get to spin around. Okay, this is right here. Senator, right. I have a comment, and I want both of you to comment upon it. Fred used to be my state representative. I lived in his district in St. Louis. Did, did you vote for him? Oh, I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> or as we used to say, early and often. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of amazed at the present administration and uh, that we can uh, send people Whenever a big corporation gets in trouble, the government will send out a big economist to help this fellow. Now, we loan $300 million to Lockheed Aircraft, 
And we're not talking about helping a city or a particular person. We're talking about eight million citizens in, in New York that's going to be affected if New York City defaults. So I'm certainly happy if, that you haven't closed your mind on poverty. And I certainly favor helping New York because you're helping um, eight million people. Would you come in? Well, I think you're absolutely right. And I think not only are, are we talking about eight million, Fred, but we're talking about an awful lot of people who own the bonds. I don't know how many people in this room here are involved in a pension plan of some sort, but it might surprise an awful lot of people right here in this room in Kansas City to find out that they have pension plans that are invested in those municipal bonds. So we're talking about more than 8 million New Yorkers. We're probably talking about an awful lot of people right here in Kansas City and an awful lot of, of medium, uh, middle income, low income people who have a lot of their life savings invested in municipal bonds that are gonna be hurt. Now I read where Jackie Onassis is gonna be hurt by $100,000 a year or something. That doesn't bother me too much. It, <laughs> it, she'll be able to squeeze through somehow. But, <laughs> but I am worried about not only the 8 million New Yorkers, Fred, but I'm worried about people all over the United States who have pension plans 30 years of their life invested in a municipal bond in New York City. I was in a bank in Boot Hill, Missouri last week, and a, a fine rural bank down there has a heavy investment in municipal bonds in New York City. And they're worried. And so are the people in that community worried as to what will happen to that bank if those bonds default. So it is bigger than just New York City. The testimony yesterday indicated that there are, Jerry, over 200 banks in the United States that have 20% or more. Some have up to 50% of their assets, of their holdings in New York City or New York State obligations. The testimony also indicated that there were at least three banks in Missouri, unspecified, unnamed but at least three banks that had these substantial holdings and that those banks would be in jeopardy. The reason the list of these banks has not been released up till now is they don't want to start a run on the bank. That is, with the depositors here, that Bank X has got all these New York City uh, securities, they have to run in and grab them. I came up here to ask a question about taxes. I will in a minute, but one other aspect of New York City that has not been covered. These are municipal bonds and the yield from them is tax-free. Now, if the federal government gets in the guarantee business or starts buying them, or comes in somewhere or other, gets their hand in it. Do you anticipate that this is going to mean perhaps uh, the lifting of the guarantee or the tax-free provision uh, of those municipal bonds? It would be a heck of a note if you issued a tax-free New York City security backed up by the federal government, and it would compete in the marketplace with a, with a Cameron security or, or a Kansas City security that didn't have the federal government guarantee. In essence, what you were doing, you'd put a premium on, on bum paper or weak paper and you'd put a penalty on strong paper. So the new issue, if there's to be one, will not be a tax-free security, it will be a taxable uh, bond backed up by a U.S. government guarantee and thus, theoretically, would not be in direct competition with other tax-free municipal bonds. Uh, the second question I have is on the tax bill presented by President Ford. He, uh, I think, proposes to cut $28 billion in taxes and uh, uh, also cut spending by $28 billion, which sounds good if it's your taxes that get cut and it's not your federal program that gets cut. The president came along and realized that uh, tax cut was very popular with the people, so he said, I'm in favor of a tax cut. He failed to point out to the people the purpose of the tax cut. $22.8 billion was to stimulate the economy, to turn the economy around, to put people back to work so they could get a salary so they could pay taxes instead of drawing unemployment compensation, food stamps, and welfare. Now the president comes along and says, yeah, I'm for a tax cut, but I'll go you one better. Instead of raising taxes or, or cutting taxes 22.8 billion in two years, I'll cut it 28 billion in one year. But there was a catch. He wanted to cut government spending dollar for dollar. Now, you can't stimulate the economy if you cut taxes 28 billion by cutting spending 28 billion a like amount because there's no stimulus except for the short run. It's interesting to note the time period we're talking about, because a tax cut would take effect January 1, 1976, which is a taxable year. The spending breaks would be applied the fourth quarter, October 1, 1976. That's the fiscal year for government spending. So what do we have? We have a, an accelerated spending, an acceleration of the economy, a stimulation of the economy with a $28 billion tax cut. The first three quarters of 1976 which just happened to coincide with the presidential election campaign. And the brakes aren't applied until the fourth quarter of 1976 or about the time 
that the election is over. Now, those of you who can remember your history back about three years ago ought to recall that this is precisely what happened in 1972. It's called the Nixon Game Plan. <laughs> Mr. Nixon overly stimulated the economy in 1972. He and the help of the Federal Reserve Board. There was a great stimulus to the economy. And then the election was held in November. January, he took office and immediately started to impound every major government program he could get his hands on. In other words, he overly stimulated the economy in early 76, put sharp brakes on it in January, uh, early 72, uh, and put the brakes on it in early 73. And I, I think that the Nixon game plan of 72, rapid uh, escalation, quick breaking, coupled with, I think, maybe the Johnson spending in the Vietnam War, gave us the inflation, recession, economic mess we're in today. And I hope the people aren't uh, crazy enough to buy it again in 1976. Being a foreign-born citizen of the United States, uh, I'm very much interested to hear your viewpoints on foreign investment in American agriculture. I'd like to add I'm also one of, the, as you nicely put, one of these enlightened Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> the question is directed to Congressman Jerry Lippin. I do think that we need to do a better job of monitoring where those investments are. And I've co-sponsored legislation that would establish a commission just to monitor the foreign investments. Uh, I think if the Arabs are going to wake up someday and own General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, that we ought to know about it before it happens. But I think we ought to monitor it. I certainly don't think it makes much sense to say they can't invest in this country. Also, we have to realize that it would be to our benefit, in my opinion, if the Arabs did have some investment in the United States, so they would have some reason to want to protect their investment. Absolutely. It's very interesting to note how very interested the United States is in some very small countries, depending upon how many of our people have investments in that country. We want to protect our investment. And I like the Arabs to think twice before they do anything to hurt the United States, and I suspect that if they had some investments to protect here, they would do it. I want their investments, but I don't want them to control a major vital resource uh, or product in the United States. Congress, uh, both the House and the Senate right now, are playing with a $112 billion defense budget. And I was wondering if, uh, while we're talking about balancing the budget and uh, this, you know, curbing some inflationary problems, if we can't talk about cutting the defense budget some, and if you'd like to comment on that. Uh, I don't think any, bu any budget is sacred. I don't think any budget is immune from close scrutiny to get the fat out of it. And indeed, there is a lot of fat in the, in the full breadth of the federal budget. And there's some fat in the defense part. So I will offer, along with Senator Mathias of Maryland, a Republican, uh, an amendment to cut back the uh, defense appropriation budget and to make it conform with the outside spending limit, Jerry, you'll, you'll recall that we passed earlier on this year under the new Budget That's Control right. Act. There's a new act on the books that says, Congress, you've got to be just like a, a household individual. You have to plan your spending for the whole year. You have to see how much you're going to spend during the year and, and, and target it, and plan it. So we, the first year we've been doing that. And I will vote to support the outside spending limit that we in the House and the Senate adopted earlier this year, which is about close to $2 billion below the figure that the uh, our Appropriations Committee is now considering. I'm an American history teacher and a government teacher at Central High School in St. Joe, Missouri. It seems to me that 1976 is a long way away economically. And therefore, what can plain everyday citizens like the people here in this room do to get to non-elected people, such as a president and a vice president, to sit down and work with the Congress. It's a bad time politically. I think we have a president and vice president. You very clearly indicated it was not elected by the people. The Republican Party are not too sure uh, that Mr. Ford can be elected by the people outside of one district in Michigan. And, uh, and, and frankly, they're concerned. I think they're worried about it. I think Mr. Ford's trying very hard to paint the 94th Congress like the 88th. He's put up pictures of Mr. Truman and, and busts of Mr. Truman and given speeches of Mr. Truman and called the 94th the 88th, and they're making great efforts to get elected in 76. I think they're more interested in votes in 76 and solutions in 75. But let me, let me go on and say this. I think the Democratic Congress uh, is, is just as much to blame because we're not too happy with every piece of legislation that we pass being vetoed by the president. And I think the Democrats are just as much to blame with posturing politically, with trying to embarrass the president, with being unwilling to compromise and cooperate. And I, I really suspect 
that the people who are losing by this political game that's being played with the energy of our country that has no party label, in my opinion, are the incumbents of both parties, and they better wake up before it's too late. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's a, a very candid and balanced answer. You know, the easiest thing for Litton and Eagleton, we'd say it's all Ford's fault. He's vetoing those things. He's a tough man to get along. It's all his fault. It's that president of the United States, and, and that would be your sort of partisan kind of an answer. But the, the truth is there's some blame that has to be uh, shared, I think, equally. It is somewhat President Ford's fault. It's the Democrats in Congress as well. Tom, our time has gone out, and uh, time has gone very quickly. Well, can we, we take these two? We run out of tape. Oh, out of tape. We run out of tape. When and, I can uh, swear. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think at the least, should we take these two fine gentlemen? If we do, we can't end it. We, we, we get to be like Rosemary Woods, okay. you know, it all kind of... <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. But I would like to thank Tom for coming here, and, and uh, he's a busy senator, and I know, because uh, he's perpetual motion in Washington. Uh, he's involved in everything, be it consumer affairs, agriculture, education, economics, uh, foreign affairs, and uh, I'm very proud to be a, a member of the Missouri delegation and, and serve with Tom uh, in the United States Congress. And, and, Great of you to be here, Tom. Thank you, Jerry. I, this is my first dialogue with Lytton, and if you'll invite me back, I don't want it by any means to be the last. This is, is really great, and great Thank you very people much. here. Thank you very much. I hope you come back next month, because next month we're going to have a continuation of this dialogue when our guest will be the chairman of the Democratic Caucus. Now, in the leadership of the United States House of Representatives, we have Speaker Carl Albert, first, who's been our guest here, Tip O'Neill, the majority leader, a friend of yours and mine, who's also been on dialogue, and really next in line in the pecking order in the U.S. House is Phil Burton, who's the chairman of the Democratic Caucus, uh, probably going to be fighting it out for Tip O'Neill for majority leader, and next in line for Speaker. I think you're going to enjoy him. He's a Democrat from California, very outspoken, very progressive, very aggressive, certainly a politician of the mm -hmm. highest order. I hope you come back next month. These meetings are open to the public. You don't have to have a ticket to get in. Just walk in. If you can't come here, join us on the more than 25 television and radio stations around the country that carry dialogue with Lytton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you very, very much. Thanks. Each month, Missouri Congressman Jerry Litton invites a well-known Washington figure to come to Missouri and join him in an unrehearsed two-hour question and answer open to the public town meeting. This has been a 30-minute edited portion of this month's meeting. Dialogue with Litton is presented monthly on this station to keep you better informed about your government.